Good morning. Coming to you from a nice winter's morning in uh, Queensland. Um, I just wanted to talk to you guys about some things I've been thinking about. And uh, that's, it's a broader subject and uh, it's about life and love, uh, naturopathy and gardening. So a bit of an <laughs> interesting combination, but it's actually just been something I've been, you know, really thinking about a lot. And while I've been doing some gardening lately, I'm sitting in my garden here and I got my star apple tree here and my lychee tree behind me. A couple of lychee trees, actually. Mango trees back there. Um, anyway, I wanted to talk to you about uh about these subjects because i think they're very very important they're the underlying motivation for uh, a lot of other issues as well so the first thing i want to talk to you about is life uh and life force so in naturopathy um we describe being a naturopath as a practitioner of vitalistic medicine now what does that mean Vit vitalistic medicine and vitality and in Chinese medicine, they talk about, you know, an acupuncturist and a uh, herbalist, but an acupuncturist in particular being somebody who moves the qi or the life force. And that's there also in martial arts like qi, qi gung and in uh, shiatsu in Japan and in Thai medicine. So what is life force? So the, the, the most important thing we have to think about here is, is who, are, who is a person? And, and beyond just thinking of a person as a human being, what is, what is, what is the nature of, of life itself, of the life force? Because it's in plants, it's in animals, you know, and that's, that's why I want to talk to you about a garden later, about the, the community of nature and the different forms of life. But what we could do is we can analyze, who am I? Um, and, and how we can do that is we can look at, um, am I this body? Am I just the physical body? If I look at myself and, and I look at even my children, you know, my daughter, how she's growing up almost three and how her body's changing so quickly at that age. And, 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 you know, I've got another son coming in the womb and he's growing, you know, feeling him as he, as he grows, you know, and touches the sides of, of the, the womb and I feel his presence. And I look back at my life, you know, I'm 50, my body's 51 years old since, uh, almost, you know, 52 soon. And, uh, how I've changed as a, a physically on a physical level as well as mentally and emotionally. So in the Vedas, they, which is the traditional, uh, you know, kind of spiritual information from India as well as the, the basis of Ayurvedic medicine, um, they talk about how we're an Atma, which is like a soul um, going through life, you know, and, and we continually are eating food and replacing our body. Okay, so, so the body I have on now is completely different than the body I had when I was 10 years old or when I was 7 or even when I was 40. Every molecule has changed, even in the brain. Every molecule, the, 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 the parts that make up the brain and the molecules there have changed. So I'm not, I, I, I can recognize myself as having a continuous existence. So if I look at the, the body that I have now, not, not a single molecule is the same, and yet I'm still the same person. I still have the same memory of being a younger person. Um, so we could also look at it, the fact that we could lose part of our body, you know, like many people have lost an arm or have lost a leg and they're still the same person. So we're obviously not our arms, we're not our legs. People can have heart transplants, so we're not our heart. We can have all sorts of transplants in the body. So we're not these parts of the body. People have lost parts of their brain in war and things like that, and they're still the same person. So we can look at it from several points of view, that we are something other than this physical body. And certainly at the time of death, there's every part of the body, every chemical is still exactly the same at the time. If we look at that exact moment of death, we can see that the, the physical body is exactly the same <clears throat> it's just something leaves and you can see it in a person's eyes you know they say the eyes are the windows to the soul and uh and at the time of death there's a difference the eyes become glazed over there's nobody there we can see that there, there's nobody there that's why we immediately 
think of, oh, how are we going to dispose of this body? Because it's going to, um, it's going to decay. But interestingly, from a massage point of view as well, uh, rigor mortis sets in, which means the body becomes very stiff. So, um, you know, you could never massage a dead body and make it loose again. So, so looseness is a symptom of the presence of the life force. And that's why all traditional forms of massage actually are based upon this chi or life energy or, um, so understanding that we're not the physical body is the first step of understanding medicine from a naturopathic point of view and medicine from a oriental point of view, Hawaiian point of view. Um, and it's about understanding about the importance of what, you know, what is the importance in, in life? And also, where does love come from? So when we work, look at the word love, the ancient Greeks had three different words for love, eros, philos, and agape. Um, and eros can be translated more as like a sexual love. Philos is like brotherly love. And agape is spiritual love. So in the Vedic system, they have a term called yoga, which many people practice today. And they practice, you know, different exercises and things like that. That's actually called hatha yoga. And it's actually about preparing the body and mind for meditation. Whereas the real meaning of yoga means to join or to yoke. Okay. And what they're talking about there is about the individual soul. So the, the, the person that's moving through time and having this continual change of body, and sometimes bodies, which is reincarnation, coming back into a different body. But we're talking about the, the yoke or the union uh, between the supreme soul and the individual soul. And that's what yoga really means. And uh, for me, I practice a form of yoga called bhakti yoga, or the love, the yoga of love and devotion. And it's about joining uh, the individual soul in a loving union with what can be called God, uh, and many different names for God, of course, around the world. Um, and it's about cultivating that love. And once we have that love in our heart, then we can have love for others not just other humans, but also animals and plants and other forms of life. And we can make a loving connection, even children and other adults, everybody. Okay, so that's the, the higher meaning of the word love rather than something like uh, the Eros thing or that sort of thing where it's more about attachment. Many people say, I love something, um, but really they mean they're attached to it. It's not about caring for that entity. So people may say, oh, I love uh, steak, but really they, that's a lust. They're not caring for the body or the soul that was in that body. Or <clears throat> people may love a peanut butter sandwich, or even people may fall in love, but they're really attached to the material form of that person and thinking that that's going to make them happy, <clears throat> make them somehow whole. <coughs> And this is very common in a lot of movies and things like that. They think, oh, yeah, that's, it's, it's uh, you know, this attachment, which we call love, is going to make us happy. But it's not actually love, because when that attachment goes, or if, if you fall in love with somebody and that person doesn't like you, it can easily turn to hate. There's so much domestic violence and things like that associated with that sort of thing. Oh, I love this person, but if they don't do what, what I want them to do, and, or if I can't enjoy them, um, then I hate them. Okay, so that's, that's really technically referred to as lust. Um, but it's called love, and that's the confusing, confusing thing about the word love. There's so many different real meanings to it. I'm talking about the, the higher meaning, the agape, uh, and even the philos version of love. So love comes from the soul. Love comes from the heart. In the Vedas, they say the soul is situated in the heart, even though it's not physically in the physical heart because it's, a, it's, a, it's an energy that's more subtle. So in the Vedas, they talk about the energies becoming more subtle. We've got earth, which is our, our heaviest, you know, body, then water, fire, which is things like digestion and intelligence and discrimination, and then air. We've got different airs in the body, um, all moving around, and that's why we, we get flatulence or burping if we have too much. 
uh, and then ether, and then mind, intelligence, and false ego before we get to the nature of the real soul. So that's the Vedic perspective on who the human being is. And without understanding who the human being is, we can't understand medicine. Well, we can't. We can't understand. We we have to. We can't understand the natural medicine or naturopathy or Vedic medicine, Ayurveda, because we don't know who or what we're treating. We're not just treating a physical body. We're treating uh, the soul. That's uh, why I love Dr. Edward Bach and his flower essences, because he realized that health is a about a soul journey through life. You know, you're never going to uh, actually make the physical body 100%. Um, you know, safe from dying. Everybody dies. But it's about the journey of life. And of course, having the physical body comfortable throughout that journey um, is important. But you know, you can have a physically healthy body and a person can be depressed, they can, they can have no meaning in life. Uh, and eventually they die. And uh, you know, was their life a success? You know, some athletes you might find like this or you know, people with physically healthy bodies but mentally, emotionally, and spiritually aren't healthy. So. In Ayurveda, we talk about the basis of health being the spirit. And the nature or the goal of life is actually to have love, to have love for the supreme spirit and love for others, just like what Jesus said as well. He was a great understander of that. Love God with all your heart, all your mind, your entire being, and then likewise love others. And to me, that's what naturopathy is about. It's actually a form of love. Uh, and we help on a mind-body-spirit level with people. And even with massage, we have to have that intuition and that empathy which comes from our soul to tune into a person and realize, how can I help this person? And how can I get rid of anything that's not actually uh, helping their real self to flourish, the soul to flourish? And that's why, you know, as a naturopath, I also use iridology and we look at the eyes and we look at the irises. But, uh, but beyond the iris, you've got the pupil, and that's where you see more of the spiritual energy of a person. Um, and that's what you see can happen after good massage as a transformation where a person gets more in touch with who they really are. But of course, meditation and things like that are extremely important. I, I practice meditation every day. I practice mantra meditation, which is an ancient Vedic principle, and it's in many cultures using Sanskrit mantras to help change our heart from being a lover of this world to a lover of God. Um, I can talk about those mantras later that I use, but that's, that's what I think is very important. Two of the things I think are very important in life is, is understanding who we are as a life force, not as a physical body. So many people think if you ask them the question, who are you? They might go, oh, I'm, you know, if it was me uh, in that physical frame of mind, I go, oh, I'm a 51 year old white Caucasian male, um, of Australian, Canadian, English, <laughs> citizenship or whatever and maybe eventually American citizenship and get married and I mean we are married get my green card or whatever so you know and 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 this sort of thing you know <clears throat> I'm a resident of such and such a place you know but these are all labels on the physical body that can that you know can change even you know even these days there's operations to change the sex of the person so so you know the real identity is beyond this right it's beyond race, you know, because like, like my daughter, she's a quarter Chinese. She's a, you know, um, three quarters Caucasian. So what race is she? You know, mixed race, obviously, right? So, but she's still a person. So, so she's not one race or another, you know. My wife is half Chinese and, and, and half French origin. So French American origin. So, uh, you know, people are, are, are not their race, People are not, you know, to describe people like that. It's just a, it's a bodily, bodily identification. And in some cases we call it false bodily identification. Because when you identify with that, well, well, one, I'm not going to be 51 for <laughs> very long. I'm going to, my body's always changing, you know, but I'm, I'm the same. I'm the spirit soul in the, in the, in the body and I'm the same person. I'm, I'm you know, I'm not even going to be Brandon Rayner eventually, you know, that'll, a label on my body, but my you know, at the time of death, I'll, I'll move on somewhere else. Have another body, maybe. Or, you know, who knows, right? Might have a different name, but I'll still be the same person. Still me. Still always looking at, you know, life from, from the perspective of, of my me being me. So, anyway, that's a lot to do with the, the Vedic knowledge. And, you know, I got my diploma in Ayurvedic medicine, plus studied a lot of Ayurvedic knowledge and Chinese medicine and Hawaiian medicine to a certain extent. So... The next thing I wanted to talk to you guys about is the importance of a garden.
And uh, it's something I've really realized. I was brought up in cities and I, I realized, you know, a couple last uh, 10 years I bought, I had a property in Hawaii for a while. And now I've had this property along with my wife in um, near the Sunshine Coast of Australia, a place just outside of Gympie called the Palms. And we've, um, it's 17 acres, you know, we, it was quite affordable for us to buy, a lot cheaper than buying a one bedroom apartment in Sydney. And we've, we've planted hundreds of fruit trees and, and native trees and, and the, you know, the native trees have all sorts of flowers on them that attract birds. And we cleared some of the invasive species and now we've got koalas on the property and all sorts of wallabies and, and, uh, you know, quite a lot of different animals. We've seen echidnas here, uh, possums and all sorts of stuff. So we're creating like a wildlife refuge along with a fruit, uh, forest what we call a fruit forest or a food forest we should say because it's not just fruit we got carob trees growing we got all sorts of you know trees that are not just fruits um, and what I've realized is it's just so beautiful to have all forms of life around you you know living in a city you end up just having mostly human forms of life or cockroaches or sometimes you know in Sydney or somewhere you might get some possums or somewhere but in general you know you're mostly dealing with the human forms of life whereas I find it really meditative to be in communion or, or in, in harmony with, with some of the other forms of life around me. Uh, you know, like on our property here, you can hear we've got all sorts of birds and they're all having their different discussions and, and we've got plants and, and they're all forms of life, you know. And, um, you know, from a nutritional point of view, of course, eating fruits that are freshly grown is so different than buying them from the store because they're ripened on the tree as well. So, you know, my goal here is to is to produce as much food as possible um, in a in a harmonious environment. Um, and and thinking about global warming and that sort of thing, you know, it's like uh, this land was cleared um, to put more houses on it, but we ended up putting a forest in here instead, but a food forest. So it produces food, and it also you know sequesters the carbon. Or however, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know the exact terminology, but basically it helps with global warming. Um, and you can see that forests are cooler, you know, than a desert in, in the daytime. They're actually, can, can, they maintain warmth at night. Um, so they, and they, they, they're, they're, they harbor so many forms of life. So it's really good for the soul as well to be around these different forms of life. Because, you know, so much of, I find a lot of humans get very mental and thinking how intelligent they are and how important their minds are. And I've had some very close relatives of mine who are very, very intelligent recently. He had a stroke, one in particular. And, 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 and you know, seeing how his intelligence has changed because of the, the brain function is not quite the same shows that, th that what's really important is, that, is the soul and not just the intelligence, you know. And I think, you know, Caucasian culture in particular and some Asian cultures really emphasize the mind, you know, and how important it is to be intelligent, whereas in... A lot of spiritual cultures, it's more important to be humble and to realize there's so much going on around us. Um, and humility is where love will be found. You know, intelligence, you know, you could have a Nazi rocket scientist be very intelligent, but there's no love. Um, and it's not going to make a person happy. And it's not going to make a person in communion or in that state of love, which is what we're all actually craving for. We're like fish out of water, um, looking for love. You know, because love is what's going to ultimately make us happy. That that deep, obviously, uh, connection or yoga of the individual soul with the supreme soul, getting us back in tune with our loving connection with God and our loving connection with the supreme. But then it's also about nature and the different forms of life. And they all teach us things. Like birds can teach us so many things and fruit trees can teach us things. I mean, it's amazing how giving they are. I was speaking to a guy yesterday, I was buying some different types of mangoes, Alfonso mangoes, which I've been looking for for a long time, which are some of the sweetest mangoes in the world. And, uh, you know, just thinking about how, how giving fruit trees are, you know, they, they, there's no, you don't even harm them when you eat the food. They, they basically give it to you and they want you to take their seed and poo it out somewhere, obviously. Um, but it's, it's beautiful to be around really beautiful fruit trees, I find as well. So, so I encourage all, all of you to think about Maybe even like if you're living in a city to, to, to contemplate, can you go and buy some land somewhere and uh, turn it into a, a, a food forest for yourself, your nutritional value, but also for your mental and spiritual and emotional health. I mean, even with all these lockdowns and things, it's so much better to be locked down on 17 acres with a bunch of birds and fruit trees and everything um, than it is to be locked in an apartment in a big city.
And also it's about commuting with not just humans, you know, because humans aren't the only form of life on this planet. There's so many forms of life and a forest brings them all together. And you can, you know, connect with them and listen to them. And, you know, it's like the birds and, and that sort of thing. It's beautiful. And seeing different flowers, you know, I mean, it's just like, like looking at these grevilleas right here that are, that are in bloom. I mean, it's just, there's just so much beauty. So, and that's where, you know, again, I, I talked about Dr. Edward Bach before. He was a great mentor. Not, a, not that I ever met him. He died before I was born. But his teachings were a great mentor for me about health and about how flower essences can help our mental and emotional health. So, anyway, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Um, you know, what is life? Love. The importance of love. Um, you know, the, the importance of, of nature and gardens and food forests. And, you know, what it means to be a naturopath, being a vitalistic medicine practitioner. Um, and I think it's a wonderful career. And uh, if ever you, you know, do want to become a naturopath, we have courses in it. I, I personally am suspicious, like in countries like Australia, when the government gets involved in, in uh, accrediting courses and things like that, because unfortunately governments seem to be bought out a lot or have big donations from pharmaceutical companies who are not necessarily promoting a natural point of view. Um, instead of like, you can't with medicine, this is the big thing, right? You can't patent a herb because it's owned by nature, by God, or, you know, it's not something a company can own, whereas a drug they can, so they can make more money out of it. So that's one of the big differences between natural medicine and being a naturopath or a herbalist and uh, pharmaceutical medicine is, you know, pharmaceutical companies want to make money out of their products, whereas anybody can grow a plant if you got the seed. So anyway, that's just another issue about what distinguishes a natural form of medicine, which is a whole big topic in itself. But lovely to talk to you guys. I just wanted to, you know, connect up with you and, uh, and uh, yeah, discuss those kind of things. Looking forward to any comments that you have. Aloha. Oh, I wanted to, yeah, you know, I was actually going to talk to you about those concepts like aloha, what aloha means. You know, I lived in Hawaii for a long time. And aloha actually means basically it's a loving connection between one person and another. So it's from, it's a, it's a heart greeting. It's not just the same as hello. Same as namaste in, in India. Namaste means, you know, I, I recognize the spirit in you and, and I pay respects to you as a spirit. So aloha is similar to that, but it's almost like, uh, you know, I spread the love from my heart and from my soul to you. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can describe aloha, and it's not always easy to get them into English. But those are a couple things I also wanted to just mention to you about the importance of certain things in certain cultures. You know, it's not like in our culture, a lot of things is about how rich you are, how famous you are, how intelligent you are, how beautiful you are. Whereas a lot of cultures, they might emphasize how loving you are. And that's certainly how I'm trying to bring up my children is, is, is about loving, being loving and being of service to others because that's a form of love. You know, when I massage people, it's about being a service. You know, it's not just like, ooh, I'm all about making the money. I'm actually trying to be of service to people. And that's a very important attitude to come from as a healer, as a naturopath, as a massage therapist, you know. Obviously, we all need to make a living, but that shouldn't necessarily be your primary motivation. It should be actually... A naturopath, a massage therapist should be a, a career of love. That's why it's called a noble career. And, uh, you know, it's something that at the end of your life, I always think, oh, at the end of my life on my deathbed, in those, you know, five minutes before I die, what am I going to be thinking about, about my life? And was it, you know, valuable? I'm not going to be thinking about how much money I have because that's not going to be there in five more minutes. You know, what I'm going to be thinking about is, is, was my time on this earth successful? Was I, was I useful? Was I of service? Did I have, you know, people talk about job satisfaction. Well, what about life satisfaction? You know, was my life satisfying? And, and, and when it's based on love, it is It's satisfying because you commune, you, you, you make this world a better place. There's so many things out here trying to make the world a worse place. Well, let's just counter that by us doing the best we can. And I always say, don't worry about perfection. Just do the best you can to engage in loving activity. You know, people talk about loving acts of kindness. Well, you can also do it as a career. You know, you can be a good massage therapist as a career, even though, yes, you make money out of it. But your primary motivation is is to care for other people. 
and the same with being a naturopath. So, yeah, just wanted to talk about those as well. All right. Aloha, everybody, and I uh, hope you're all doing well. I know it's a difficult time for everybody in the pandemic, and, you know, um, spreading the my love to you, and uh, I hope you're all well.